I was just, you know, popped out of my body. Wow. So I said, you know, that's what I said. And now I'm outside my body. And so my first thought floating, you know, a couple of feet above my body was, wait a second, how does this work? How can I be outside my body and still be me? I'm still me. The way I identify as myself in this physical plane, that is exactly who I was outside my body. I was just didn't have my body. Just like if you step outside your car, you don't have your car with you and you step back into the car, right? So it's that feeling, but you're still exactly who you are, but you're outside the body. Welcome in. I'm Kimberly. We have an exciting guest for you today. I can't wait for you to meet her. But before we get started, if you're enjoying this content, go ahead and click that subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of our exciting videos. In addition, if you'd like to keep in touch, we do have a fabulous email newsletter that goes out every Friday morning. It's super short, super sweet, filled with a lot of great information that we think is important to know what's going on on the planet today. It's super easy to sign up. The link is in the description box down below. It's super easy, super fun. I think you're going to love it. So let's hop in today. We're talking with Dr. Lottie Valentine. Doctor, welcome in. Oh, thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. I, I am so excited to talk with you because there are so many very interesting parts to your story. You are a near-death experiencer, a medium, and a naturopathic doctor. That's quite a resume. So let's start from the very beginning. I know that this was not something that you were aware of that was going to happen in your life. So tell us what life was like for you before your first near-death experience. It was very different. So <laughs> if, I think of, if, I, if I think of myself, you know, 30 or 35 years ago, listening to this podcast and what I believed back then, I would just say those people are so kooky and they're so crazy and they're they're so nuts, out there, right? They're nuts. Exactly. They're, they're they're sad and crazy, right? So <laughs> yeah, so my life was very different. So I was complete atheist. I grew up in Sweden, which is in uh, northern Europe, up in Scandinavia. And if back then, when I was born, the state and the church were not separated. So if you were born in that country, you were a Lutheran. And the church is the, is the people that kept track of all the people. We got passports issued through the church. Wow. So, right? Until, mm -hmm. I think, I don't know, maybe 1970s or something, it changed. But so I didn't believe in anything. My father was a, a physician, a general practitioner. My mom worked. She was like a hospital floor administrator. I had three older brothers. And my father had grown up going to Sunday school since he was three years old. He knew the Bible backwards and forwards but he did not believe in it either. And so with that very scientific household, you know, everything was black and white. Well, it's either there or it's not. So that's kind of how I was raised. Though my mom was more, you know, more spiritual. And my grandmother was, was I think, a medium, but we didn't talk about it. <laughs> so we can talk about that later. <laughs> but so I was very scientific and uh, I got married and I moved to the United States. And I uh, went to Boston University majored in management information systems, computer science in, in the school of management, then worked for IBM in New York uh, as a programmer and systems analyst. So you, I mean, you can't get any more left brain. You can't get more in the box. Tell me the facts. <laughs> Let me arrange it all in little boxes. <laughs> yes. I mean, it was just, you know, just such a scientific outlook um, of how things you know operated in the world for me. And then I had my first child and I had my second child and I had my third child. And uh, by now I had taken a leave of absence. So I was staying home with the kids because they were all little. And after that third birth, well, my third child had two boys and they were six and three and a half. And then I gave birth to my daughter. Now, first she was born during a 7.4 earthquake. So during that moment, so we were you know in the labor unit, in the hospital and I mean, the, the building was shaking. It was one of the times in my life when I thought I was going to die. And I'm so sure you were right in the middle of labor when this happened, contracting three minutes apart. So, oh my gosh. and then we lost all the power and the hospital started to shake. 
and that hospital was built on rollers. So it was rolling back and forth. And there were windows from floor to ceiling and I'm lying on the table. Everybody's leaning over me to hold, hold me down. So I don't levitate off the table. And, you know, I said to myself, there's no way we're going to survive this. The ceiling tiles are going to crash in or the windows are going to break and we're just going to get buried, buried in all the rubble. Well, we did survive and that we lost all the power. So the generators kicked on. We had the light of a night light in this birthing unit because it was, you know, like a early in the morning. So it was dark outside. And then my labor actually stopped for a moment, just start for maybe half an hour or 40 minutes. Um, because when you are in severe danger, if, if you are in the jungle and the lion is coming to eat you, you are going to stop giving birth, get yourself to safety, and then the labor will kick back on. So that's actually what happened. It was that much fear, um, you know, that my labor actually stopped. So then I it started back up and I gave birth. And then because of the, then we had another aftershock of 7.2. And so eventually I finally got to hold the baby. They gave me the baby and I started just screaming to my husband, take the baby, take the baby. And I was just arching my backwards. And that was the first time I hemorrhaged. And so we are running in, we're in a hospital that's running on generators. So I'm sure they were not going to take me to do a DNC or anything like that. Um, and I don't know what the protocol was because this was in 1992 and they put me on IV drip and I stayed, I remember staying like two days in the hospital and they were making sure that the bleeding had stopped and things looked good, sent me on my way. So then 10 days later, uh, my friends were going to have a baby shower for me in the park. And uh, because I had a baby girl and I had two boys before, so everybody, you know, was excited about that. And I went to the park and then I felt like I needed to use the restroom. So I take my kids to the restroom and I, I hemorrhaged this huge blood clot. You know, we're talking the size of a, of a man's large fist. I mean, it was just huge. And I throw my kids in the car. I tell my friend, I got to go. I don't know what's wrong, but, you know, I just hemorrhaged, drove back home. And my parents were visiting from Sweden to help with the birth and taking care of the kids and all that. So they called my husband. He came home from work. We went to the ER. So we go to the ER and they do a manual inspection and they say, well, there's not much bleeding going on right now, but we'll keep you for observation. So I stayed for, you know, two or three hours, not much happened. And they sent me on my way and they said, could have been a second lining that came out, but there oh. was no, you know, lab work, um, no ultrasound. There was no, that would check for an infection or anything. It was just a manual visual inspection. So I get home and then the next day, the same thing happens in the evening. I hemorrhage again. I go to the bathroom and have this huge blood clot come out. And we called the hospital and I yelled to my husband, dude, I am not going back if they're not going to do anything. And it was late at night and they said, okay, we're going to have her see the doctor where you live tomorrow morning, which was, we were current, we were living in Huntington Beach, California at the time. So the next morning we go to the doctor, same thing. He does a visual inspection and says, well, not much blood is coming out right now. Sends me on my way. That uh, afternoon, around 4.30 or so, I hemorrhage again. So now we said, okay, well, this is the third time. We got to go back. So we went back to the hospital, told them what had been going on. And they said, okay, we'll do a manual inspection. They come in <laughs> again. They look, well, not much bleeding is going on now. I mean, it almost sounds like a comedy at this point. Right, right? yeah. Uh, it's just you know, it's, it's just incredible that you can go that many times to the hospital without anything being done. But I'm sure this has happened. Everybody has a horror story. They know somebody has similar stories. So anyway, so they leave me there and they said, okay, we're going to keep you for observation. So I'm lying on this table, the door, they close the door. I don't have a bell to ring. And after a while I start bleeding again. So I'm just thinking, well, you know, finally, at least I'm bleeding in the ER. And I think that, you know, the spirit world sent this nurse to check on me at this moment because the timing is, you know, down to the seconds of me being here today because I could just have died right there and it would have been too late. Um, so she opens the door to check on me and she sees that I've been bleeding and I hear the call on the loudspeaker, you know, OBGYN, stat to the ER, OBGYN, stat to the ER. And within, you know, 30 seconds, this middle-aged physician comes running full force into the room with a younger physician in tow. And he says, what's going on? So I told him I'd been bleeding. You know, this is the third day this has been happening. 
And he looks and he can see all the papers in the wastebasket that the nurse had cleaned up. So he had an idea that I was, it wasn't just a trickle of blood we were talking about. So again, we do a manual visual inspection. <laughs> so, and it's during this time, right? So they do, they do a visual inspection. At that moment, I hemorrhage. So oh, at least, gosh. you know, it was the timing. The timing couldn't have been any better for everything to fall exactly into place. So at that point, I try to sit up and I tell him, I don't feel too good. But he, now he knows because he saw how much blood came out and he he knows that this has been going on for three days now. So he just pushes me down on the table and I can hear at this point, my eyes are closed now and I can hear all the staff coming into the room and he, he tips the table backwards. So my head is going towards the floor. My feet is going up towards the ceiling. And I have a nurse on my right that's quoting my blood pressure. And I have a nurse on my left trying to get an IV in, place an IV. And you're about three quarts low by now. Right, right, exactly. So, you know, in 1992, I guess they didn't place IVs. Many times now you go to the ER and you hear, you know, your patients complain and say, I don't know why they gave me an IV. IV I don't need anything, right? But it's a precautionary because you don't know what's happening to this person. Are they going to go into shock, Right. So I'm lying on the table and I feel like I just jumped out of an airplane free fall and I can, it's probably my blood pressure that's crashing at that point. So as I'm lying on this table, I'm thinking, what's taking her so long? The nurse on my left. But when you start going into shock, your veins collapse, right? So it's very difficult to get an IV in. And that's why they place the IVs on people that are yeah. you know, completely awake and aware in the hospital, because if they do crash, they have access to the IV. So that's a good thing for if anybody has had that experience. So I'm lying on this table. I feel like I'm falling through the sky, wondering what's taking the nurse so long. And the nurse on my right is quoting my blood pressure as it's dropping. And at one point, she yells out in this very panicked voice, 50 over 15, hurry. Oh, my yes. goodness. Yeah. So now, and it's shortly after that, she yelled at, I knew that I was dying. And uh -huh. that was very different than the experience I had when I was giving birth, when I thought I was going to die, right? Many times you're almost in a car accident. You see your light flash before your eyes. You're thinking, oh my gosh, this is it, right? That was the experience giving birth, thinking that that is now a possibility. But this was very different. I knew that I was dying at that point. And I can feel my soul starting to separate. I feel like something is is trying to leave my body. I had the cessation of uh, something rising out of my chest kind of feeling. So here I am, the complete atheist on the table, <laughs> remembering how I was confirmed when I was 14. And I said, well, you know, if there is a God out there, I, this is it. I'm either, I'm either going to live or die at this point. So I prayed to God to save my life. So I said, I have three children under the age of six. They need a mother. Please let me live. And Just in case you're there, I'm letting you know. <laughs> and it was shortly after that, I was just, you know, popped out of my body. Uh -huh. So I said, you know, that's what I said. And now I'm outside my body. And so my first thought floating in a couple of feet above my body was, wait a second, how does this work? How can I be outside my body and still be me? I'm still me, the way I identify as myself in this physical plane. That is exactly who I was outside my body. I was just didn't have my body. Just like if you step outside your car, you don't have your car with you. You step back into the car, right? So it's that feeling, but you're still exactly who you are, but you're outside the body. But in this state, um, so I know that the body down on the table is mine, right? So I know I belong to the body on the table, though I don't turn around, you know, how some people see themselves from the corner. No, I'm just kind of floating above my body. But I know that there's no time. I'm in a state where there's no time on the other side. Time is completely irrelevant on the other side. This drove me crazy for years. <laughs> I searched the entire public San Francisco Public Library for anything on time. I was reading Stephen Hawkins books. Please explain to me why there is no time in the state. Because in that state, I knew I had access to past, present, and future all at the same time. There was no division of the past and the future. Like the way we look at the way we are here on earth is we only have the present moment. 
like a second, you know, it's a second into the future or a second into the past. It's, it's only the now that we, we can identify with. But in that state, I knew there was no time. But there is also that, you know, unconditional love, unconditional peace. There's absolutely no pain. You're just in this bliss state. And then that's all I got to experience during my first NDE. And then I got pulled back into the body as quickly as I had left. It's just a split second. And then, you know, my second NDE, which happened two years later, it's, I always joke that they, they saved me too quickly the first time. So I didn't get the full effect. And so we have to do it one more time to get this woman on the right path in life because she's going down the wrong track. That's how I feel. So then the next day when I'm still in the hospital, I, I can hear. So I'm trying to figure out what was that? How could I be outside my body and still be me? Did I have some kind of a hallucination? But it was no, it couldn't have been because it was more real than being in this dimension now. Right. These experiences are so extremely real that they seem I think more real, at least to me, and I've heard other people say that too, how it just seems more real in that other state. So I'm lying in this hospital bed and my sister-in-law had passed away about two weeks earlier and she's in the left corner on my ceiling and she says, everything's going to be okay. And I'm thinking, wait a second. I'm like, what's happening? I, did I hallucinate yesterday? But I don't think I did. This was an experience. And now I think I can hear my sister-in-law. And I, I, you know, was almost afraid of it on my own experience because I did not know what that was because I didn't have any belief in the spirit world. I didn't have any belief in anything like this. And the nurse that came in to check on me, she said, oh, did you have, did anything unusual happen yesterday in the emergency room? So I think she might, either, she might even, she might have been there or she might just have been aware of near-death experiences. I had not heard of near-death experience. It was completely a foreign topic for me. So I look at this nurse and I say, no, no, nothing at all. It's, and it's don't just... look at the woman in the corner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Now with your sister-in-law, Lottie, were you seeing her or hearing her or did you just know she was there? I knew she was there and I heard her. So I didn't have the vision yet now I see everything. So when I work, I see, I'm clairvoyant. So I would say 90% of my information is visual. Uh, but then it, you know, it was just the knowing and the hearing, which is interesting because that's what came first, but then the visual is my dominant, but I'm also a visual learner. So, you know, I think it goes together because we all work with our senses the way that it works best for us. That's why everybody is so different. Some people only hear, some people only hear, see, or, 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 um, feel right so everybody works differently i have all of them but in there they come through in different ways when we can talk about that we talk about like mediumship or med, uh, working as a medical medium or medical intuitive because the way i get the information depends on what the question is <laughs> so it comes either visual or auditory or feeling depending on what it is that they're trying to show me so anyway so i was really sick and i you know have all these things happening and um the spirit world is coming through and I have all these different things that happen along the way. Um, we can talk about those later too, but electrical interference on my watch has stopped. My uncle came to say goodbye when he passed. And so I had all these experiences. And then um, I was having something called bone marrow suppression, which is when your bone marrow suppresses and you're not making enough blood cells. So I was anemic. I didn't have a good immune system and I was bruising just by touching something. And I... Um, we had pneumonia when my, my daughter was six months. It took me six months to even leave the house. And because they should have given me blood, but the, the first thing the doctor said in the ER, he said, I'm going to have to give you blood. And I look at him and I say, if you don't have to, please don't. And he said, do you have a religious belief? And I said, no, but everybody that was getting blood in, 19, in 1992 were getting AIDS six, you know, six years later. So they decided to not give me blood because I was 34 and I was young. I was healthy. Uh, there was really nothing wrong with me. I was in perfect health. And they said, you're not going to feel too good for a couple of months, but you know, you're making blood and, you know, gave me all this medication and supplements and who knows what. And it took me about three months to 
I think I slept mostly the first three months. Um, at least that my parents stayed. They changed the tickets back to Sweden two or three times. And then my mother-in-law came. Now it's September and I'm finally sitting up, right? Sitting up in a rocking chair. So I pretty much slept for two months, just making blood. And being, I was under a wool blanket in July in California with cold, right. freezing hands and feet. And my head was pounding because I couldn't even keep my head on a pillow because that would drain too much of my blood and it would cause a, a headache. So it was then by Christmas, we all got the flu, but we didn't have medical insurance because my husband had taken a new job and we were on the wait, the three month wait period. And we went to a walk-in clinic and everybody got antibiotics and whatever we needed. And then everybody got well, except for me, I kept getting sicker. So after eight days, I went back to the walk-in clinic and they said, um, okay, we're going to take your blood because you're way too sick. I had this raging ear infection, pneumonia, and was just getting sicker, even though they had given me antibiotics. And they pricked my blood and they came back in and they said, you have no immune system. Do you have AIDS or leukemia? And I said, well, I hope I don't have AIDS because I, I refused, we didn't do the blood transfusion, but I told them what had happened. And so it's called what that disease is called is idiopathic aplastic anemia, which means it's a suppression of the bone marrow. And this is, it makes... The only thing that makes sense, and now that I have gone to medical school, I can, you know, say that, well, that's what I had. But I kept getting sick, and then I, five months goes by, and I got sick again. Now it's May, and I have, I bump into the baby's changing table, something that would give you a bruise the size of a nickel. And I had a bruise that spanned my entire hip area that was purple and red. And I was getting pneumonia, and it's mid-May. And so I go to this doctor. We were still waiting on insurance because... It was, it's a long story, but my husband's company got sold when I was having a baby. And so everybody was laid up from top to bottom and he was in a regional management position. And, you know, it's hard to jump and get a new job within two weeks. You have to support a whole family. So he just took whatever best job. And then three months later, he got another job. He was offered another position. And then three months later, he was offered another position. So that whole year, we never had medical insurance. So this is why this is, became such a crazy story. But so I went to the, to the doctor and he saw the bruise on my hip and he thought that our husband was abusing us. So he rips off the shirt and all my kids and he can't find a bruise. And I look at him and I say, hey, I'm telling you the truth. This is what happened to me. And I obviously know something is wrong with my blood. My father was a general practitioner. I heard all the medical stories growing up. So, but I said, uh, we're getting insurance in six weeks. I'm still here. I said, as crazy as it sounds, I put my children in the car and drove myself here and walked into this building with my three kids, right? Something I would not have been able to do six months ago. So even though I could tell something was terribly wrong, at the same time, I was also, I felt I was getting better because I had more energy. So again, we do, you know, all the, the, the antibiotics and the inhalers and the steroids. And he said, you have to go to the, um, you know, get your blood your blood drawn. And I said, well, I'm not going to because they're going to see it's a pre-existing condition. And if I get worse, I will. But if the medic, you know, if this medicine works, then I'm just going to wait. So we finally got insurance July 1st. So, but, so this is the condition I'm in. So I have, I'm struggling with this bone marrow suppression. So I have too little blood in my body. So I'm constantly feeling faint. And because I'm feeling faint, I mean, thinking back, you know, how sick I was at that time and the feeling of, the soul wanting to leave. So, oh. and, you know, I would always feel, have the, almost like when you lay a puzzle and then the last piece doesn't fit and it sticks up and you sort of pat it in. And that's the feeling that it's like the soul constantly separating from the body. And I would just constantly say to myself, okay, we're not leaving, we're staying. So get back in my body. And that was just my existence uh, during the first couple of years. Um, the first three to four years were like that. I couldn't stand up long enough to cook for my children. I had a stool in the kitchen. I sat at the stove so I could make pancakes for the kids. You know, a, a difficult existence. And my head was you know, always pounding. And then I would wake up in the middle of the night, take my head off the pillow. Because here again, I feel like my soul is going to pop out. And, you know, I'm going to have another ND. Well, that's exactly what happened. So one of those nights I wake up, same thing, you know. But I'm just, this is my existence now. You know how you get used to being in a certain way. And so I just take my head off the pillow, you know, thinking, okay, I'm just going to, it's the usual thing. But just like in the ER, one second you're in the body, the next second you are not, all right? So I get pulled out 
And, but this experience is so different. And that's why I say I didn't get the full effect the first time. Almost like the spirit world's like, no, we're going to keep her sick for a while so we can do this again. And so, so the second experience, I feel like I'm just tumbling through darkness. I think like Star Wars, a spaceship traveling through space. And I get to this place that I call the mid station because there was an awareness, just like when you go into a skyscraper that has a hundred floors, you push the button on the 50th floor. When you step out on the 50th floor, you know there's floors below you. You know that there's floors above you, but you don't know what's on those floors, but you you are you have that awareness. It was like that. So I get to this, what I call the mid station, because I knew there was levels below me and I know there were levels above me. I also call it the bouncing station because they sent me back. It's like, okay, you got here, but no, you're not getting any further. It's like the bouncers bounce you back to earth. So... I arrive, I arrive to this place that I call the mid station, but I hear the most beautiful music. This music, you cannot make this music on the earth plane because I tried. I sat at our synthesizer for days trying to come up with one sound that was similar to the beautiful music I had heard. But it's you can't make it because it's more beautiful than that. And I look to my right and I'm thinking, I see this little log cabin almost like a Swedish sauna, like a little log cabin. So I'm thinking the music must be coming from the log cabin. So I open the door, look inside, but it's empty. So then I look to my left and it's a mirror image of the same log cabin. And I open the door, look inside, but it's empty. But then I become aware of this uh, growing um, light, almost like a fog rolling in that has a spotlight on it, right? So it's that kind of feeling of, being uh, immersed in the light, right? But almost like being a, a cl- floating into a cloud that is lit up by spotlights. So it's just surrounding you. And as I turn around to see, you know, where is this where the music is coming from and what is this light? What I see is an outline of angels in the white light and the music is coming from the angels. But I have complete awareness because I'm still me And I see these angels and I say, I don't believe in angels, but the music is coming from the angels. So it's really funny how you try to make sense, like even in that position of your own experience. But there's also that awareness of that light, that is God, that is divine source, that is who we are, that is what we come from, that is what we return to. We carry that light within us. We are that light. And that light, that light is just love. It is pure, unconditional love. If you could stay there forever, you would. And so I think that's why they just send you back. <laughs> so I, so no, some people get the choice of staying. But that is just um, uh, pure bliss, unconditional love, that light. And, and that is divine source. It comes, we come from that light. But then I become aware of two spirit guides and the spirit guide on my right talks to the other spirit guide on my left. And he says, what's she doing here? She can't be here. She has to go back. And I'm like, no, no, no. Wait a second. How can this be? How can I be outside my body and still be me? And the spirit guide on my left says, well, if I told you, you wouldn't remember, but you will remember this. And then it's like, I'm all of a sudden standing on the moon, looking down on the earth but around the earth, there is a there is a silvery, glittery fishnet. Well, you can now it's called the grid, but this is 1994, so we didn't have the internet then. And to me, my best description was a silvery, glittery fishnet because fishnets are diamond shaped. And growing up in Sweden, I would I spent my summers on an island with no uh, electricity or running water. And I would row this little tiny rowboat for my grandmother and she would lay lay fishnets in the ocean and catch fish for the family to eat. So when she lifted these fishnets out of the ocean in the early morning sun, those little water droplets on the fishnet would sparkle in the sunlight. You know, I'm just like a seven, eight year old kid rowing this boat. And so I'm looking at down and it just, it looks like a fishnet. It looks like this, you know, sparkling fishnet. And the spirit guide says, everything on earth is connected to each other. But everything on earth is connected up to this grid. And with that message, I got sent back. And so that was, uh, you know, about 29 years ago now, 1990, well, uh, 
yeah, it was just about 30 years, 1994, we, we just hit 2024. And with that message, I get sent back. And But that is also what all my work is today, that understanding of how we are connected to each other and we are all connected to the grid. And so that has become my life work. And that's why I always joke and say, I didn't get that message the first time. So spirit world was like, okay, we're, we're going to, we have to towards. do it again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> We're going to give her the full effect so that she gets on the right track. So she knows what she's yeah. supposed to do. Yeah. So my question is atheist doesn't don't believe in anything. Very material, you know, believes in materialism. This is you. How are you integrating this? Like when this experience happened, you're hearing things, you're seeing things. What are you doing with that inside of yourself? And how are you, you know, making sense of it? Yeah, so it took me a long time. It took me 12 years to trust in the spirit world. So for 12 years, you know, I keep getting messages and, and hearing things, seeing things. And it started, so that first year, uh, even before my second near death experience, in the middle of the night, I knew my uncle had passed away. And so my uncle comes uh, and says, and I can't see him. I know he's at the end of the bed. He's hovering between the ceiling and the and the bed. And he says, I've I've passed on. I'm I'm going on to the other side. I'm just coming here to check in and uh, you know, and saying goodbye and letting you know. And then the next day I figured my mom was gonna call because it was her brother, and nobody called. And I said, Wow, that's so strange. And then uh, another day goes by. Now it's Tuesday. This happened like the night, Sunday to Monday. So nobody called Monday. And I figured, oh, maybe she'll call tomorrow. No, no call. Wednesday, she finally calls. And she says, you know, hey, how are you doing? How are the kids? You know, all the, did a little check-in. And then she says, well, I have something sad to share with you. And I said, yeah, your brother passed away three days ago. And it was just dead silence. And she said, how do you, how did you know that? And I said, he was here. He came to say goodbye. And her response was, oh, you're just like your grandmother, her mom. Oh, so it there just, it is. So there yeah. it is, right? And yeah. So it's interesting because many times you hear how it runs in families. And I remember my grandmother sometimes. So uh, she had uh, this house on the island and we also had the house on the island. And I remember the story when she said I was probably again, seven or eight years old. She said, I know my friend so-and-so passed away at two o'clock in the morning. And I said, and she was crying. And I said, well, you know, how do you know? How do you know that that, that happened? And she said, the bird came. The bird flew into my window at 2 a.m., woke me up. And I know that that was the message from the bird. And so then we get in the little rowboat. We go with this little out, a little motor on this rowboat to, the, to another island that now has a payphone because there was no payphone on the, our, our island. And she, you know, puts all these little coins in the telephone and then, you know, phones to the city to find out, sure enough, the person had passed away. And I know that, you know, just little things like that are coming back. But I think that she didn't talk about it much because I'm sure my, you know, with my dad <laughs> being her, you know, son-in-law, that she wasn't going to, you know, talk too much about those things. So you've had these two experiences and you continue to hear things and see things. Are you adjusting your belief in the world? Are you adjusting your attitudes about maybe there is a spirit world or you just think right. that you're different? Right. So, yeah, so it took me 12 years. So so that was one of the experiences my uncle came through. But then I started seeing things before that happened. And so now my kids are it's probably just probably about 10 years out. Um, and so I see I wake up in the morning and I have three images, uh, slides, slides, kind of like a slideshow. And I see the van door. We had a van at the time. And I see this black scratch across the passenger side van door. And then my ne the next image is my two kids in the car. My daughter is in the back seat. My middle son, middle child, the son is in the front seat. And then the third image I get is I'm leaving a note on the windshield of a black sedan car. I'm like, what is this? So I tell my two kids, I said, you guys are in the car. This is what, what I saw. This is I what went, we're looking for. <laughs> right? <laughs> Where could this happen? Because most of the streets we were living in, uh, you know, outside San Francisco at the time. And my kids were in school in the city. They were students at the San Francisco Ballet School. And so I was driving them to the city uh, most days. And so we were figuring out, and all of those streets are one-way streets. Where could we possibly get hit on the right-hand side of the car? That means we have to turn left and there has to be oncoming traffic. 
Well, there was only one intersection. The whole trip into the city and back, there was only one time we turned left with oncoming traffic. So we get to the light. My kid's nose is pressed up against the window. The coast is clear, mom. You can go. And so this went on for about, you know, 10 days or two weeks. And, you know, we're all nervous. Like, what is this? You know, it's this, this accident that's supposed to happen. So we're in the bookstore in Walnut Creek, which is in East Bay, San Francisco. And we're coming out of the bookstore and there was this big truck offloading books and, and things for the bookstore. And I'm trying to squeeze onto this little tiny narrow street back before they they made Walnut Creek a big place. <laughs> back then it was a small place. Yeah. And so I'm trying to yeah. squeeze my car out onto the street. And as I'm turning right, I scrape the car that's parked with my on the right hand side of my car. Was it black? was a black sedan car <laughs> <laughs> so now you know I get out of the car I look at the scratch and literally I just throw my arms up in the air and just look at the sky and laugh I mean the people that they were just staring at me they must have thought I was just this crazy woman who laughs at the accident but I was just so happy that to know that it was over everybody was safe and it was just cosmetics you know of a the scrape but there I was leaving that note on the windshield. So, you know, the reason that I know the spiritual world is very real is because I've had personal experiences, but you never hear about a medium who decides to be a scientist. Right. And it always goes the other direction and nobody comes back the other way. So it's just, it's an interesting process, particularly for someone who had no belief system in the spiritual world or that kind of understanding to watch how that changes. And, you know, I interviewed Dr. Evan Alexander a few weeks back. And he, what he says is as a neurosurgeon, if someone had told him the, his story, he would have thought that they were nuts and maybe referred them, you know, for a psych review. So it's so interesting to me. How did you go from being a very science fact-based person to then deciding that you're going to work as a medium, maybe you're going to become a naturopathic doctor. So what was that progression? What came first, being a medium or going to school to be a naturopath? Um, so the medium part came first because I, would ha I was having all these messages, right? So I started being so scientific that's why I think that's why it took me so long because I needed proof over and over and over again. And I would write things down because I would get a message and I would start writing it down in a book. And I would say, you know, this is my, this is my dream. This is my vision. This is what I heard. This is what I saw. And so then when those things happened, I could go back and say, okay, I wrote it down. I, it's not a deja vu, right? <laughs> I wrote it. It's right there. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I had to sort of prove it to myself that it wasn't a deja vu because I was just constantly trying to explain it away as a coincidence and deja vu and this can't be right. Um, but then when I started, you know, having these experiences and more and more, and I had a one was a remote viewing of my kids. So I saw, again, the same two kids, but now they're older. And so my daughter is, uh, you know, about 13, 14. My son has a driver's license. So he's like 16, 16 and a half. And I'm at home in East Bay, San Francisco. So I'm like a half hour drive from the, from San Francisco. I am on my way to the kitchen to, you know, I said, okay, I should start prepping dinner. And then, you know, when they get home, I, all the prep is already done. So I'm on my way to the kitchen. And all of a sudden, it's like I'm standing on the street in San Francisco. And I see my kids in the car. I see my son, my son sitting at um at a light trying to make a U-turn on the Embarcadero in San Francisco. And he's waiting for the light to turn red and he's going to go right when it's like yellow and it's turning about turning right. He's going to whip the car around. I see the oncoming traffic on the other side. There's a truck and the truck is thinking I'm going to make it through before oh. it hits. Instead of stopping, he's accelerating. My son is thinking he's going to stop because it's yellow. He's counting on the fact that the, the truck's going to stop. The truck doesn't stop. It accelerates. So he whips the car around at the same time as the truck accelerates. And I'm, it's, it is if I'm standing on the street and I'm watching this happen in front of me. And I can see the, the truck is literally an inch from the back of, of my kid's car. And I can see them speed. I can see my kid's car speeding off, you know, down the road and, you know, that they're safe. 
I just sat at that kitchen counter for like 10 minutes, you know, panting because, and I, and I was just, again, throwing my hands up to the spirit world saying, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, mm -hmm. for saving them. And, and then, you know, the kids came home later, a couple hours later, they're home. And I didn't say anything right away. So I just waited for them to finish eating. I said, you know, got to get the blood sugar up, right? And as soon as my daughter finishes eating, she looks at me and she says, mom, we almost got hit on it by a truck. And I said, yeah, I know. I saw you, you know, that you were making. Oh, I just the got kids, goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> the kid's jaw just dropped. And, you know, yeah. that is also, you know, we're all connected. We're all connected here on earth. And uh, that bond that we have, you know, between a mother and a child or other, you know, loved ones. I mean, we are so connected to that. We're almost like two little magnets uh, in that, it, you know, you can easily tune into that. Um, in the, in a situation where there is danger, just like moms know. How many stories have you heard where yeah, you just told know. the child to stay home from school and then something terrible happened because they knew, but they didn't mm -hmm. know what, what it was. Yeah, And that is that interconnectedness that we all have. Mm -hmm. So it was, a lot, it was 12 years of these kinds of experiences. But after 12 years, now, I mean, at, at this point, I knew to trust the spirit world because it didn't matter uh, I couldn't change things. Uh, you know, I was told people were sick and I would call uh, my sister-in-law. I said, you know, it sounds, I keep hearing gallbladder liver spleen on for your cousin. And we knew he had, he was in college. He had just had his appendix out. And my daughter looks at me and she goes, well, you better, better call auntie. So I call auntie and I say, Hey, uh, you know, are you back home? And she goes, yeah, I just got home, you know, yesterday. Uh, you know, how's your, how's the cousin doing or your son? Well, he was, you know, he's doing great. He's out of the hospital and he's back home now. And I said, look, I keep hearing his name in gallbladder liver spleen. So she calls him and says, how are you feeling? And he goes, well, after you left, I got worse. So she gets back on an airplane based on what I heard. She just gets back down to New York City, gets back on an airplane, flies back to Colorado. And he uh, gets hospitalized because he, it turned out that he had gotten an infection in the gallbladder and they had taken the gallbladder out. And then he gets released from that. And then literally two months later, he's in an accident uh, with his horse and he loses his spleen. Oh my gosh. And then at Christmas, we were had a family gathering and I said, no worries, you're going to, you're going to get to keep your liver because <laughs> they've stopped chatting. <laughs> but, you know, it's just like a lot of, of things like this. And also when my father was passing away, I saw his coffin. Uh, he had had a stroke and I talked to my brother who is a surgeon over in Sweden and he said, no worries. They, you know, they're moving him out of ICU. He's on their recovery floor now take your time. Why don't you just fly out Monday? You're bringing all the kids and everything. And that was, um, I talked to him like Wednesday, Thursday. Now it's Friday. We bring all the kids back to this famous bookstore <laughs> and then to get them books on tape because the kids were like 12, 10 and seven at the time. And I was going to bring all the kids uh, with me to, uh, you know, go see grandpa in Sweden and cheer him up. And as we are in the bookstore, I keep seeing a coffin. And it's a white oh. coffin with a flower arrangement. But the funny part is I see this coffin from an angle as if it's from above and from the right. Because the coffin, every funeral that the, I had ever gone to, the coffin is either horizontal or vertical uh, up in the front of the church. But I saw this from an angle slightly above from a right from a right hand side angle so i kept seeing that coffin i kept telling my husband i said this is my dad i know he's gonna die and he said no 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 you're just worried about it and i cried the whole week and i was like i knew i couldn't change it didn't matter what i asked for what i prayed what i you know anything it didn't matter and i get there uh, we get there tuesday I flew out monday we arrived tuesday this is a long flight from california and as soon as we get there, it wasn't one of my brothers that were meeting me. It was my sister-in-law. And she said, we have to go now, like this second. Like, can we use the restroom? No, we have to go now. So I knew it was he was close. And we just made it there. And he passed you know, an hour after I got there. So he was basically just holding on, waiting for me. But I had known that. It was now it's Tuesday. I had known it since Friday because I had yeah. seen that coffin. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, rearranged our tickets. We stayed for the funeral. And the funeral was held in this place that it was a round, a round room. And there were these benches that were like a like a tier, like a oh. like a stadium. And as soon as I walked in, I understood why I had seen that image. 
but I wasn't going to go sit myself there again. I needed more proof. So I asked the lady, I say, Hey, I am the daughter. Where should I sit? And she said, pointed to the spot, you know, second row on the right. And when I went to sit in that position that I was told to sit, that was the exact angle that I saw that had seen that yeah. coffin. And yeah. the same thing with the flowers. When we got the flowers, there was a big binder and my mom said, you know, can you pick the flowers? Help me pick flowers. And I said, no, mom, you pick them because the flower bouquet I had seen, I saw it on the page. And she said, should I get this one or that one? And I said, you know that the best. Why don't you pick the flowers you think he would have liked the best? And that was the bouquet she picked. That yeah. was exactly the flower arrangement. So yeah. all these experiences of, of experience, you know, like knowing that I couldn't change what I saw, uh, spirit world coming in, you know, spirit guides talking to me. And how did I then end up in med school? Well, after 12 years of this, so now it <laughs> took me a long time to trust it. 2004. Um, I'm looking on the computer and I'm thinking, well, I have changed so much. I can't go back to be a programmer. I'm not even close to being that person anymore. And I know I'm here to help other people. And I was looking for something about healing on the internet. And I found this school and then realized it was a real medical school. And I just sighed and I said, I can't do that. I'm in my 40s now. I mean, even if I do all those prereqs of you know, chemistry, organic chemistry, physics, bio, math, all the things I didn't have as an undergrad, I would have to do all of that and then apply. And, you know, there was no guarantee they were going to accept me. I'm older than most students. And I closed the computer. I walked towards the kitchen and the spirit world drops in and the spirit world says, you have to become a naturopathic doctor. So that was number one. And you're, com you're here to combine East and West, which I kind of looked at old and new. And you are to bring messages and healing to the people. What are you talking about? <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. That's not what a doctor does. <laughs> messages. And then they say, you are to write two books. No, wait, three. And I'm like, I say, what books? What? I don't know what to write about. What do you mean messages? What does that mean? When the time is right, we will tell you. For now, just start, start your prereqs. And school was starting in two weeks. So in, miraculously, I got all my transcripts from undergraduate, applied into the community college, and I had to start from the beginning. I had to, my first class was advanced placement high school biology because I couldn't get into the freshman class because I had no science. So I had to start really, you know, all the way from the beginning. And then that is how I ended up in medical school when I was 54. But that message of you're to write two books, no, wait, three. I've gotten that from four mediums, uh, you know, in two in the United States and two uh, at Arthur Findlay College in England, where I studied mediumship. And the teachers can't, said this exact, the exact wording. Oh, your mom is here. She tells me you're writing a book. And I said, yeah, actually I am. But nobody knew. Nobody knew. And she said, oh, your mom says you're to write two books. No, wait, three. And it, that message is always exactly verbatim, the exact same mes message I got. And it wasn't until... 2017. So I graduated um, 2016. I graduated from med school, took my boards. And then you have to wait for the license. You don't even know if you have passed right yet. And I meet this woman. I'm studying craniosacral therapy because I'm waiting for my license. So I have to do something while I wait. <laughs> so I studied craniosacral therapy with the Upledger Institute. And I met this woman and she said, hey, I'm, I just moved to uh, Phoenix. Let's have dinner sometime. So a couple of weeks went by and we met for dinner. And I was actually doing my residency up in the mountains. So I was coming down for a, a conference in Phoenix. So I'm thinking, I barely remember what she looked like because we hadn't worked together. We just knew that we both lived in Phoenix and we were both, you know, interested in craniosacral and probably other things. I didn't even know what her career was. So we're waiting for, for our table and we're sipping on a glass of wine, just chatting. And she said, I'm a medium and I know somebody is here who wants to give you a message. Are you open to receive messages? I just kind of laughed and I said, sure, <laughs> of course. Thinking there is no way she is going to be able to tell me anything from the spirit world. No, that's connecting to me. And she couldn't even guess my life is so different. I grew up in Europe and well, sure enough, it was my mom. We talked about the fishing and the robot boat and the fishing nets and all of that came through. So I knew it was my mom for sure. And she said, your mom says you have to go to Arthur Findlay College. And I said, 
I just graduated. I don't even have my license yet. How am I supposed to do that? I have student loans. I'm like, I got to make money. I got to, you know. Every time I turn around, you guys are telling me I have to do something. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, of course, after the third time of, of the message coming through in different ways, I said, okay, fine. I will figure out a way to get to Arthur Findlay College. And then six months later, I was at Arthur Findlay College. And that's when that journey began. But it's really funny to think about. So now it's 2017. So since 1992, I've been hearing the spirit world, right? That's a long time. So now it's 2017. So we're talking about 25 years later. I go to Arthur Findlay College and I'm still doubting that you can actually Oh my train. gosh. I know. Isn't I that amazing? So scientific. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a joke. I mean, I laugh at myself now. But I, so I, when I, people tell me, you know, I'm, I'm an atheist, or I don't know if I believe this. I just started my spiritual journey. I hear you because it took me such a long time. And I had those experiences. I mean, if I had not had those experiences, there is no way I would be doing what I'm doing today, right? Because it's, it's all these experiences that have guided me to trust it. And I know that the spirit world has not been wrong once in 31 years. So they are always right. And you know, that led me to study mediumship at Arthur Findlay College and, and honed in on those skills and, you know, learn how to connect with, you know, a, a spirit world for other people. Uh, but now my work is all, it's all become spiritual, right? So I, it, you can't turn that off at this point because now it's been 31 years uh, yeah. talking to the spirit world. So I work as a medical intuitive or medical medium a lot. And I also work as do ancestral healing, but I also do, uh, you know, readings, evidential mediumship readings for people. Uh, but I also do a really fun session that is messages from your spirit guides. And that is really good for people who, uh, you know, they're kind of wondering, am I on the right track? Am I doing the right thing? Or, you know, I always had this longing to be a dentist or I always had this longing to write a book or be a counselor or whatever it is. Right. And that's things like that typically comes through on the messages from the spirit guides. Cause it's that main spirit guide that comes through, but I see the, I see the spirit, I see the uh, spirit world and I see the spirit guides. So then I do this quick little sketch of what I see of the spirit guide. And then I, I take a picture of it and, and email it to the, to the client. So they have a picture of their. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, I was so excited to hear that your guides had said, not only do you need to go to medical school, but you need to go to Arthur Finley because what I believe is that what you're doing now is where medicine is going. And I think that we have been sleeping on the fact that you can get an intuitive into the situation and uncover medical issues that may take conventional Western medicine years, if ever, to understand. So that it's really exciting to me to see the work you're doing, because I think that you're a pioneer in where we're going medically and how to heal the body. How much of what you see and do, do you feel is much more vibrational or much more ancestral mm, wounds or you know, those little parts of ourselves that maybe were injured and we haven't healed. What, what is your feeling about that? Is, is most of what we see, you know, in the hospitals really just emotional issues bundled up and then created into a medical issue? I think a lot of things, I mean, stem from the mental, emotional and our own experiences, because we do know from scientific studies that there are certain people that get certain diseases, right? So we have studies on that, the way we process our emotions. Um, and for people who are interested in that, uh, Dr. Gabor Mate's book, When the Body Says No, is a really good book because all the research is in there backing up, you know, why is it that these women get breast cancer? Why is it that these nice people get ALS, which is a terrible disease, right? But it talked about the research that they did uh, on how those people process their emotions. So is there an emotional tie to your disease? I think in some uh, circumstances, yes. But there are also things that we are born with is the way the tissue is laid down as you are being created a human in the womb. And the way that tissue gets laid down may later cause problems, right? So DNA defects, literally. 
Uh, but then we also have the ancestral wound. And so we tune into just like I saw with the, 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 the grid around the earth. Everything is connected to each other, but we are also connected to each other. Um, but we know that from the people who got the Nobel Prize last year in physics, the three physicists that proved that the if you have one pair of atoms, let's call it uh, pair A of atoms, and then we have pair B of atoms. Now, one of the atoms from pair A meets one of the atoms from pair B, right? And so now they are entangled because they have met. But the two atoms that stayed behind, the, the one from A and the one from B that didn't meet, they are also entangled now. So whatever happens to atom B is going to affect atom A and vice versa because one of the pairs met, right? And but it's the same in ancestral. So we are all connected to our ancestors through uh, what I call the grid, right? Because that's what I saw, mm -hmm. the invisible grid. But we also know that trauma is passed down on the DNA. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah, so there is a great study uh, that was done back in 2013 uh, epigenetic inheritance of ancestral odor fear conditioning, where they uh, took the male mice and only the male mice, and they exposed them to a cherry blossom smell. They gave them a little electric shock every time. And so now they feared the cherry blossom smell. Then they took the sperm from the mice, artificially inseminated the female mice, so they never even met. And those little baby mice guess what? They fear the cherry blossom smell because- Isn't that wild? They had never even met their, their, their deities, right? right? Nobody ever met. And it's transferred on the DNA. And we know from Holocaust survivors that the DNA gets, it, we have even, they've even identified genes like the FKBP5 gene was, I think, one of the first ones and how that gets transferred down. So the trauma that those people experienced changes the DNA, right? Because it changes your epigenetics, what you experience, then you're going to flip the switch on just like you could have a bad DNA, but it doesn't, you know, the BRCA gene, for example, for breast cancer, if people are familiar with that. And it doesn't mean you're going to get breast cancer because you're carrying the gene. You also got to have the circumstances that flip that on. So think of it just because it's in your computer, in your hard drive, doesn't mean you're going to use it. You need the software to activate it. Right. So it's the same thing with us. We have to have the software experience of activating our epigenetics to then turn those things on. So that's just having the gene doesn't mean that something is going to be bad. You may never turn that gene on, even if it's a bad gene. Right. So there is always that epigenetics part that's going to flip things on. But that is how we are all you know, interconnected with each other. So it doesn't matter, you know, you think that you are so separate, but it's an illusion. It's we illusion, are not yeah. separate. We are all in the same soup together. And the more compassion and love we can have for each other, the more we're going to heal. Yeah. But it's never just one thing, right? So it's not just the emotions and it's not just the DNA. It's not just the ancestral wound. It's always a combination of all of the above. So when people say, I'm really spiritual, I know I can heal this, that's great, you know, go do all those things, because it's definitely going to help. And it's not not going to hurt you by doing all those uh, mental, emotional uh, processing and praying and tuning and whatever it is. But, you know, I always tell people don't put all your eggs in one basket, because we don't know what ticket you pulled for this life. Maybe you're the one who's going to heal with chemotherapy but your friend is going to heal with a carrot juice. And that next person is going to heal through some uh, meditative uh, experience where they have an, a spiritually transformative experience. We don't know what ticket we're holding on to because we've been blinded. We have this blindfold on. We can't see that, right? So I always tell people, do all of the things that could work for you. Don't put all the eggs in the, in the same basket. And also intuitively, what do you feel like is going to work for you? Mm -hmm. Because I think at the, at the bottom of it, we with, we have a knowing if we can just connect to it. One question I have is because you were so fact-based, so science-based prior to your first NDE, and then you came back in with all this connectedness, what is it that happens when a person leaves their body, has an experience, and then comes back in, that all of a sudden now their senses are much more acute. What's the, why do you think that happens? 
I think, well, there's a couple of different things that go on. I mean, just medically, you know, the polyvagal yeah. nerve. Um, yeah. Right? So the polyvagal nerve, when anytime you have trauma, you're going to affect your poly polyvagal nerve. Uh, so we all retuned for just by being in the pandemic. Everybody retuned their nervous system because that's what- To stress. Is. Right. Yeah. And so- we Not get, in a good way. <laughs> yeah. And so there is a lot of, you know, you become hypervigilant. So if you're, if you're a child that lives in an abusive home, you're going to have antennas at the back of your neck. You feel like you're walking on eggshells all the time. So you are going to have, be very empathic. You are tuning into all the people around you all the time, right? Very common with uh, people that are empaths is that they had some kind of traumatic uh, childhood where they had to be on edge. It could be in school, the environment in the school, the environment in the home, the environment at the babysitter, but they had to be very, very aware. They had tuned into other people's emotions, their feelings. Literally, they grew extra antennas to yeah, the radars, yeah. right? To scan their environment. So people who have near-death experiences are also, they typically come from some sort of trauma. So they're experiencing a trauma that then causes them to have a near-death experience and go to the other side. But that the trauma itself is going to activate the polyvagal nerve, which is cranial nerve number 10. And so, and that goes through your ear. And so you're going to be more sensitive to loud sounds and things like that, because we are tuned, our nervous system is tuned to be aware of growling noises, like a, like a bear oh, coming like, to eat Like you, a lion right? behind you. But and with you, because the watch is kept stopping, mm -hmm. that tells me that there must have been a shift in your electrical system. Right. The way I, yeah, the way I look at it is the frequency is off. Yeah. Right? So your frequency is off. You come back and things aren't working that great because everything is slightly off. Right. And so that's how, that's how I look at it when it comes to the, oh, my watch is stopping. You know, they, it worked for five days and then I couldn't even get a new watch. It took me nine months before I had the strength to get a watch. And then I bought a new watch and it stopped. I bring it back to the store and they look at me where well, I haven't gotten any other watches back. And I said, they said, okay, pick a new watch. So I get a new one after five, about five days, it stops. So I bring it back and I'm, and again, I'm thinking it must be the, the manufacturer. They have a problem with quality control in manufacturing. <laughs> coming from a business undergraduate business major. So I'm just kind of saying, all right, I'll get a different brand this time because this brand, they have a quality control issue. Let me get a different brand, get a different brand watch where for, you know, five days it stops. So then I tell my friend and my best friend and she looks at me and she says, it's not the watch. It's you, honey. It's you, honey. <laughs> you just don't want to admit it. Mean, it's me. <laughs> so it took me. So the, my, when my daughter was about three, I had 16 or 17 watches in my drawer and I only bought them with the second hand moving because it's the only way I could tell if it started ticking again. And sometimes when it laid around in that drawer, it would, they would start working. And so I would hold the watch up one after another. Oh, this one is ticking. So I'll wear this one and I would wear it again for you know a week or two and then it would stop and then look in the drawer for another watch. And so it was just this constant rotating. And it took me 12 years to have my watch tick exactly almost to the day, 12 months. So after one year, they ticked about a month at a time, two years, two months, three years, three months, pretty on average like that, all the way to 12 years. And at 12 years, I said, that's it. I finally did it. I healed. And that's when in 2004, when I got the messages that I had to go to med school and then all of a sudden everything changed. Interesting. So now that you're you're a naturopathic physician, you work as a medium. Tell me a little bit about your practice. Like, are you mostly working with people with medical conditions? Are you mostly a medical intuitive? How does that work? And what a cool skill to have to be able to talk with someone and say, you know, you might want to check your liver and your spleen. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I actually work, um, uh mostly online now. Uh, and I work as a remote health consultant uh, and a medical intuitive where I work with people all over the world. And it's typically the people that fall through the cracks because we have a tendency to think that when we get sick, I'm going to go to the ER or I'm going to go to the doctor. They'll figure out what's wrong with me. Let me tell you, it's not like that. So It's not I like, mean, well, look at what happened to you where you kept yeah, going back it is, in. It's an art. It's a, it's a lot of it is an art. And there are many, many times when people get sent to the ER, they go back to the ER, they go back to the ER again. 
you know, three or four times and they keep falling through the cracks because the tests that we have is not going to test for a lot of things. I just worked with somebody um, over in Spain the other day and this person had uh, an endocrine issue where they were making too much uh, of a, one hormone. And, you know, so the night before, I always do this, I always say the spirit world, before the client comes on the screen or like the night before, the morning of, I say the spirit world, okay, this person I'm working with, medical intuitive, what's wrong with them? And then see what the spirit world tells me and I write this down. And it's, you know, it's always spot on about what's wrong with that person. You have good guides. Right? <laughs> You've got some A plus guides there. <laughs> so I heard, so this, so the night before I heard it, it's, it, he's, the, this person is toxic and it's plastic, plastic, oh. toxic plastic. Okay. So we get on there and, you know, we check, okay, well, did they check your pituitary? Did they check this? What test, you know, did they run these tests? Okay. All right. And they didn't find anything, any problems. No, they don't know what it is. And, you know, I'm making twice as much of, of this one hormone. And I said, all right. So the spirit guide says that it's a toxicity. So plastic, is there any way, like, are you eating or drinking from a lot of plastic bottles? Do you have a factory close by? Person looks at me and says, there is a factory about um, 18 miles away. They burn things all the time. And when I sweep my apartment, there is all this dust. And when I'm done oh. sweeping, it looks like a plastic ball. And he says, it's, I can see all these little plastic fibers. And he said, a lot of people in this village say that this town is contaminated. And then the other half say the town is not contaminated. And I said, yes, because they don't have any symptoms, but the other half do have symptoms. Think of it like COVID. Perfect example. Some people would test positive for COVID. The whole family is sick. They're just walking around feeling great. They have a little cold maybe, right? Other people are fighting for their life in the ER. It's the same thing with everything, every disease, every toxicity. Those other people have a really good detox pathway. Just think of all the people that smoke that never get lung cancer right? There's a lot of people that smoke their whole life. They die of a heart attack when they're 95, right? I know. And then somebody else <laughs> smokes and then they die when they're 42, right? Of lung cancer. But again, it depends on your DNA, what you incarnated, your detox pathways and everything else, right? But that the messages I get from the spirit guys, I always trust those. And sometimes people come on the screen and they'll say, I know you're talking about allergies, but do you by any chance have really painful menstrual cycles? <laughs> and they're like, yes, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, that's what they're telling me. It's the, it, yeah. That is the underlying issue. And okay, now I see, understand why you're talking about yeah. allergies because it's related to it this way. Yeah. So it's a very, it's a very uh, unique. Situation. You have such a unique little <laughs> niche. I mean, it's fascinating right? Because to I me. have the medical knowledge to yeah. understand. So sometimes the spirit world just gives me a diagnosis and then I have to say, okay, the spirit world tells me you have this disease. And they just look at me like, what is that? And then I say, okay, well, these diseases would have these symptoms. Do you have those symptoms? And they're, yes, that's exactly what yeah. I mean. Yeah. So it's really interesting. It's that, yeah, the, the work, but you know, the interesting part is that we all have this, we can all tune into the spirit world. We're I all know, but spiritual yeah. beings. And it's just been suppressed over yes. all by the Western world because. Which is a whole nother conversation. Mm, yes, it is. <laughs> it's like, we all are connected, yeah. but the suppression has been pervasive and intentional. Yeah. Yes, yes, so, it has. Yeah, but we're waking up now. We're waking yeah. up. Yeah. And I feel like you are such a symbol of that because when I heard your story, I said, she's at the cutting edge of where medicine's going to be going. This is what's going to be absolutely normal. So I think that you need to get with the AMA and start, you know, some lessons or training for them. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think it's coming, right? Yeah. I and I think you... Those. People you're going to tune into that. Yeah. And you're leading the charge. You're one of the people leading the charge. I think that's fascinating. What a, what a, uh, what a cool mission you have in this lifetime. Right. Yeah. So this has been fascinating. Where can we find out more about you? Uh, if you go to my website, that's probably the easiest. It's Dr. Lottie. So dot -E com. And on there, you can see all the different um, spiritual sessions that I offer one-on-one. -on -one and any upcoming classes that I'm teaching. Uh, and then also the newsletter, subscribe to the newsletter so you can stay up to date. And uh, every two weeks, I release a podcast uh, the, on, you know, that I interview people on my podcast. And it's all about uh, helping other people heal. So it could be anything from 
a medium or a shaman to a physician, um, to an acupuncturist. Uh, I could be almost anything, but it's the things that I see, um, to even surgeons, uh, things that I see fall through the cracks. I try to get those people on my podcast to help get that information out to people yeah. around the world so that uh, when they hear that maybe it's for them or maybe it's for a loved one, then they can find, by hearing those conversations, they know where to look for help. Yeah, you're doing good work, doctor. Thank well, you thank for you. all you do. And I hope you come back and see us sometime. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, just right. let me know. Okay, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you. I hope you enjoyed this video. Coming up next, this is a good one. Or you might really like this one too. Either one of them could be perfect for you. Before you leave, don't forget to subscribe.